A very good morning to all the participants of the DTRTI Lucknow webinars 2021. And today, on 19th of November 2020, we are starting final accounts as part of our bookkeeping and account series. Friends, in this unit, <clears throat> you'll be able to draw the final accounts of non-manufacturing entities, and then that will be followed by the final accounts of manufacturing entities. You will learn the relationship between the profit and loss account and the balance sheet. You'll also understand the trading account items, which will help you to learn which are those transactions and events which need to be shown in the trading account. We also understand the items in the profit and loss account and uh, so that you, you will learn what are those transactions and events that need to be shown in the profit and loss account. And thereby you learn the technique of preparing the profit and loss account. And deriving the profit and loss account balance. You'll also learn how do we adjust the outstanding expenses and prepaid expenses, accrued income, and the income received in advance in our accounts. In addition, you'll understand what items are shown in the balance sheet. And you'll also learn the classification of the those items of assets and liabilities and the sub classification thereof. And of course, also the order in which they need to be put in the balance sheet because there is a certain order that is recommended or mandated. In which the items need to be put in the balance sheet. So therefore, in all, we'll understand the profit and loss account, the trading account, the balance sheet, how and which of the items are put there. And that is why a discussion on final accounts is very, very important. Now, first we are covering the non-manufacturing entities. Thereafter, we will be covering the manufacturing entities. The non-manufacturing entities are the trading entities, which are engaged in purchase and sale of goods, at a profit without changing the form of those goods, which means that uh, they are not processing those goods at all. They are just buying them and selling them. They do not process the goods which are purchased by them and sell the goods in their original form. Now, It undertakes certain liabilities, it makes some assets, and also incurs some expenses, just like salary, stationery, advertisement, rent, etc., office expenses to run the business. At the end of the accounting year, the entity is interested in knowing the results of the business, and uh, just like any other commercial entity, and to ascertain the final outcome, the income and financial position. They prepare the financial statements. The financial statements. Are of two types, the income statements and the position statements or the financial position statements. Under the head income statements, we are having the trading account and the profit and loss account. From the trading account, we get the gross profit. And from the profit and loss account, the end result that we get is. The is in the form of the balance sheet, which gives us a position of the assets and liabilities of the entity. 
at a particular point of time. Now, these financial statements are systematically organized and they are a summary of all the ledger accounts, account heads, and which is presented in such a manner that it gives us detailed information about the financial position of the entity's business and it gives us the information about the performance of the enterprise in terms of how much profit or the loss it is incurring. Therefore, we categorize the financial statements into two parts, the income statement and the position statement. So we prefer, we initially draw out our gross profit and then we draw out our net profit through these, through the statements, through the income statements. Thereafter, we prepare the position statement. So, the basic difference between the income statement and the position statement is the income statement will give us how much profit or loss we are making, how much not profit we are deriving, whereas the position statement will tell us what are uh, or what is the value of our assets and the liabilities of the business at the close of the financial year or at a particular time, point of time. Now, in addition to the balance sheet, because balance sheet is a very critical and important position statement, but apart from the balance sheet, in order to judge the financial position of any business, some additional statements are also prepared like cash flow statement, value added statement, etc. Now, it is not mandatory for the non-corporate entities to prepare the cash flow statement or the value added statement, but it is mandatory for the corporate entities under the Companies Act. Now, these additional statements are prepared for a better understanding of the financial position of the business. So even if it is not mandated, it is advisable to prepare these. Now, let us uh, go into the preparation of the financial final accounts. And when we say final accounts, we mean the trading account, the profit and loss account, and the balance sheet. So the important function of making the final, final accounts is to show the profitability truly and fairly, and to show truly and fairly the financial position of the business. So initially, to start with, First of all, we have to keep a proper record of the transactions which have been entered. If we don't have the record of the transactions, then that record cannot be the basis, incomplete record or in, incorrect record of transactions and events cannot be the basis of drawing the final accounts. So initially, it is very essential and it all starts with keeping a proper record of the transactions which are entered into by the business during a particular accounting period. Now we have to understand initially, first of all, what are the, the grounding principles, the basic principles as to how the data of the accounting period in, in relation to the transactions and the events is to be accumulated or is to be recorded. Now, basic principles are number one, we have to make a distinction between a capital receipt and capital payment and revenue receipt and revenue payment. So capital and revenue distinction has to be there. In relation to every transaction, we must be able to decide whether it is a capital transaction or a revenue transaction. Secondly, income and expenses only of a particular period are to be considered and not 
of a period outside that period. Thirdly, all the items of income and expenditure need to be accumulated or need to be stored or recorded under significant heads so that we can disclose the sources from which the capital has been procured and we can disclose the nature of the liabilities that have been incurred which are outstanding for payment. So therefore this headwise distribution is also important. Now, we have to understand that uh, in order to implement these basic principles, what do we have to do? Uh, to, what, to what aspects we have to pay special attention? So the first thing is to make a distinction between the personal income and the business income. As we have seen, the business entity is different, considered to be different from the proprietor. Because the final statement of accounts are not intended to show the profitability of the proprietor. They are intended to show the profitability of the business. And same proprietor may have different businesses and therefore he will have to draw the separate accounts for every business so that he can understand the profitability of those businesses separately. And therefore also it is important that uh, the personal profit, personal income, business income or expenditure. The second distinction is between capital and revenue and uh, we have separately understood in detail what is capital and what is revenue. So we are not uh, touching it in detail here. So we have to make a distinction between capital and revenue receipts and expenditure. Thereafter we have to classify the items of income and items of expenditure under separate heads as has been mentioned in the principles. Now, apart from this, all the assets need to be included in the balance sheet. And while doing that, we have to take care of the accounting principles and the accounting standards. We have to adhere to those accounting principles and the accounting standards. We have to make provision for those income and expenditures which have accrued but have not been paid because these also need to be entered in the balance sheet and some of these provisions may be made by estimation or on the same basis as in the previous year. The third matter that needs to be paid special attention to is that we should make a true and full disclosure and therefore all that information which is considered to be material for judging the profit that needs to be disclosed and must be disclosed should be disclosed. For example when the labor charges have increased because bonus has been given to workmen, the amount of the bonus that is paid needs to be disclosed separately. Because in that particular year in which a special bonus is given, the expenditure is being increased due to a special reason and therefore that special expenditure needs to be disclosed. Because that is material to determine the profitability and to determine the financial position also.
if there are some items in the inventory or in the stock which may not be saleable readily they need to be valued at approximate net realizable value and the basis of the valuation and the value of such inventory needs to be shown separately because we are of the opinion that that that, that is the kind of inventory that is not going to be readily saleable another matter that needs to be paid special attention to is that only the transactions of the current period need to be recorded and not those which are relating to the earlier period or to it so therefore only those transactions should be recorded which relate to a certain accounting period that has been decided decided previously now the next important point that needs to be considered is that it, that only those transactions which are completed before the close of the accounts should be given effect and if there are certain transactions which have not become been completed then they should not be given effect to only the those transactions which were already totally com- concluded before the close of the period of account has been adjusted in the accounts of the year for example whenever a sale of goods is to take place only after the goods have been inspected by the purchaser suppose this is a condition that sale will only take place when the goods are inspected by the purchaser and the inspection has so far not been done so since the inspection has so far not been done had not been made before the accounting year ended we would not take into account that particular sale in our account that year what needs to be understood here is that uh, only the completed transactions need to be taken into account now let us try to understand the interrelationship of the two statements that is the profit and loss account and the balance sheet so one of the points that needs to be remembered is that the total expenditure which is incurred out of that there may be some type of expenditure which is there in the profit and loss account and some type of expenditure may go into the balance sheet let us see how it is done with a few examples so salaries which have been already paid are entered on the debit side of the profit and loss account but outstanding salary which have not been paid is uh, shown on the liability side of the balance sheet also and it is added to salaries also so we can see that in the profit and loss account the salary being divided into two parts the salary outstanding salary and even if we are not showing them separately in the profit and loss account we are showing the paid salary and the outstanding salary both in the profit and loss account but out of these amounts the outstanding salary will also find an entry in the balance sheet because outstanding salary is a liability of the business trying to understand the interrelationship between the profit and loss account and the balance sheet by another example let's say a machine has been purchased now that part of the machine which is attributable to the year as uh, in form of depreciation is debited to the profit and loss account 
and the balance is shown in the balance sheet as an asset. So a part of the machine gets depreciated. A part of the value of the machine gets depreciated. So that part of the machine which gets depreciated is move it moves into the profit and loss account and does not find an entry in the balance sheet because it is reduced from the value of the machine though it may be entered in the balance sheet as a reduced value but uh, what we mean to say is that the value of the depreciation or the depreciated value of the of the machinery is reduced from the balance sheet is not taken into account in the balance sheet and it is taken into account in the profit and loss account whereas the undepreciated value of the machine is left in the balance sheet as an asset. So as we can see, the depreciation amount is reduced from the fixed asset in the balance sheet and therefore this value of depreciation and it moves into the profit and loss account and it is shown in the profit and loss account. So with, uh, with the help of these uh, illustrations or examples, we have understood one thing that there is an interrelationship between a profit and loss account and the balance sheet. And the assets which are shown in the balance sheet are only the remainder of the expenditure incurred after a suitable amount has been charged to the profit and loss account or the trading account. So whatever amount of the expenditure is not charged or even if it is charged, which is not paid or which is outstanding or amount of assets the asset liability side. So therefore, if we have to prepare the two statements properly, then it is of the greatest importance that the amounts which are charged to the profit and loss account should be properly determined by us. Otherwise, both statements will show an incorrect position. Now, the principle that governs this point that how much of charge will go into the profit and loss account, that principle is called the matching principle. Now let us understand the matching principle which needs to be utilized very carefully while drawing these statements. The matching principle, uh, principle is directly related to the preparation of the final accounts and therefore we need to understand the matching principle correctly. The principle demands that the expenses which are incurred to earn the income or to earn the revenue should be properly matched with each other. That means the expenses should be matched with the revenue. And which means that those expenses which have been incurred to earn that revenue which is accounted for should only be accounted for for a particular period. So what does that mean? It means a few things which need to be understood. Number one, if a certain revenue or income is entered in the trading or profit and loss account, then all the expenses which are relating to that income or revenue, whether or not the payment has been made or not made, will be debited to the trading and loss account. So to uh, comply with the matching principle, at the end of the year, an entry is passed to bring into account all the outstanding expenses also. That is also the reason why the opening inventory of the goods is debited to the trading account as the relevant sale is credited in the same account. To apply the matching principle, the opening inventory, since the opening inventory is sold during that year, therefore it needs to be entered into the account. 
although it was the closing inventory of the previous key, previous year or previous period. Now, next point is that if some expenditure has been incurred, but uh, against it, sale will not take place in this year, and uh, sale will take place only in the next year, or income in relation to that expenditure will be uh, received only next year, or accrued next year only, then the expenditure, that expenditure should not be debited to the current year's profit and loss account, and it should be moved to the next year's profit and loss account. And while moving it forward to the next year, it will move forward as an asset, and it will be therefore reflected in the balance sheet. And it will get debited to the profit and loss account only when the relevant income will also be credited in relation to that. And we apply the same reason for depreciation also. That only the depreciation for a particular year would be accounted for and not the depreciation of the earlier year on the next year. So that part of our expenditure or the cost which is used to earn the current year's income or current year's revenue will only be debited in that same year. Now, next point is that if an income or revenue is received in the current year, but the work against it has to be done next year and the cost in respect of it has to be therefore incurred in the next year, then whatever income is received in advance for which the work will be done in the next year, it uh, will be considered the income or revenue not of this year but the of the next year. So it will be shown in this year in the balance sheet on the liability side because as in, in form of the income received in advance, and therefore, it should be credited to the profit and loss account of the next year, not of this year. Sometimes we have, we have seen that newspapers or magazines, they receive subscriptions in advance for a year. So that part of the subscription that has been paid, that covers the copies which will be supplied in the next year, needs to be treated as the income received in advance. in case the subscription has been received. And in respect of the subscription paid, it needs to be also accounted for in the next year. In respect of though that subscription part, part of the subscription, which is for the copies that will be received in the next year. Now, against this matching principle, there, there is one exception to the rule. The rule that uh, only those costs have, uh, which have yielded or is expected to yield the revenue should be debited to a profit and loss account. To this, there is an exception. For example, if a fire has occurred and it has damaged the firm's property, the loss must be debited to the profit and loss account to the extent it is not covered by insurance. And to, in respect of the loss that is already covered by insurance, that will not be reflected as a loss because though the insurance amount is not yet received, but still that loss for which the insurance amount has not yet been received and will be received only in the next year, that needs to be debited because it is a prudent principle that if a loss has been incurred, we need to account for it. Similarly, a loss which is resulting from the 
fall of selling price below the cost or due to some debts turning bad. This also needs to be debited to the profit and loss account. Because if we don't do that, then we will stand to overstate the profit and we don't ever want to state, overstate the profit under the conservative, conservative principle. Now let us move into the trading account and how it is prepared. So at the end of the year, it is necessary to ascertain the net profit or the net loss. So to, to begin the exercise of uh, ascertaining the net profit or the net loss, first of all, it is necessary to know how much is the gross profit or the gross loss. The gross profit can be defined as the difference between the selling price and the cost of the goods sold. So if we if we diff, if we arrive at the difference between selling price and the cost of goods sold, what we get is the gross profit. For any trading firm, the cost of goods sold can be found out by adjusting the cost of the goods on hand at the end of the year against the purchases. So it is done like this. That we know that when we add the purchases, that net purchases, that means purchases minus the purchase returns. When we add the purchases, net purchases to the stock, and then we add the direct expenses to that, and thereafter, we reduce the cost of goods sold. We will, we will get the closing stock. Understand this with An, an explanation. Let's say in the first year, the net purchase is after deducting the sales returns, uh, purchase returns was 1 lakh rupees and 15,000 worth of goods at cost value were not sold uh, and they were at the part, they were part of the inventory at the end of the year. So out of the purchases of 1 lakh rupees, 15,000 was left at the end of the year as, an, uh, as not being sold. So in that case, if there is no opening stock, then the cost of the goods sold will be 85,000 rupees. This is the cost, not the sale price. Because goods worth 85,000 rupees have been sold. That is the essence of it. If there was an opening add the opening stock also to the purchases while calculating the cost of the goods sold. Now, if in the next year, purchases are now 1,50,000 rupees and the Cost of the goods sold is one lakh forty-five thousand rupees in the next year. Then closing stock can be calculated. How the closing stock can be calculated? Because we first take the opening stock, which is the cost of the unsold goods at the end of the last year which is the same as the cost of the unsold goods at the beginning of the year as 15,000. And we take this opening stock and to that we add the purchases of this year. We get 1,65,000. And against this, the cost of the goods sold, 1,45,000. If we have been given this cost of the goods sold, as well as 45,000, we reduce it 
and finally with the help of that we can get the closing stock now in case uh, in such an example if we are having the closing stock and we can calculate the cost of goods sold by directly reducing the closing stock and from the opening stock plus purchases So the cost of the goods sold is that those goods which are sold, what was the actual cost of purchase of those goods? We have to understand that very, very clearly. And the cross profit is the difference between the sale price and the cost of the goods sold. This is an important thing, gross profit is the difference between the sale price and the cost of the goods which were sold. Now we can see the a trading account because gross profit is ascertained by preparing a trading account. The format of which is like this. The sales minus sales returns will be on the credit side and the closing stock will be on the credit side. The opening stock, the purchase minus purchase returns and the direct expenses like freight and carry, etc. will be debited to the or will be entered on the debit. Basically, accounts, particular account like sale account, the sale return account, the opening stock, the stock inventory and the sale purchase returns accounts and other direct expenditure accounts that are being taken from the ledger and with the help of that a trading account is being prepared. And finally, the balance between the credit and the debit side will be taken as the gross loss or the gross profit depending upon whether the credit side is less or the credit side is more than the debit side. So as you can see that among the direct expenses, which are those expenses which are considered to be direct expenses. These are generally those expenses which go directly into the trading activity. And if it is a manufacturing activity, then those direct expenditures which go straight into the manufacturing expenditure, manufacturing process. So customs and insurance, which is paid for the, for the goods, the wages which are paid for the for respect of the goods purchased, whatever gas, water, and filter uh, fuel is being incurred for manufacturing, whatever factory expenses have been incurred, whatever royalty has been paid for production of the items, all this is covered under the manufacturing businesses that also needs to be debited in the trading account. Now, we have seen this example earlier. And if in the above example, the net sale that is after adjustment of sale return is 2 lakh, sale amount, if it is less than, if it is 2 lakh in the above example, net sales, net sales means sales minus sales returns. Supposing the sales was 2 lakh rupees, then to, under, to calculate the gross profit, we will have to reduce the net sales, we'll have to reduce out of the net sales the cost of the goods sold. So as the net sales, if the net sale was 2 lakh rupees, and we have seen in the above example, the cost of the goods sold is 1 lakh 45,000 rupees. So we reduce these two amounts And we get the gross profit of 55,000 rupees. Now this profit is called the gross profit because from this gross profit, indirect expenses are reduced because direct expenses have been already reduced in the trading account. So the indirect expenses will be reduced in the profit and loss account. And once those are deducted, 
uh, we will know the net profit. So therefore, if you have to prepare the trading account in respect of when given above, we say that opening inventory is 15,000, the sale is 22 lakh. Okay, the closing inventory has been given to be 20,000. The purchase amount has been given to be 150,000. And therefore, in order to find out the cost of goods sold, because cost of goods sold is very essential for calculating the gross profit. So in case we have to calculate the cost of goods sold, we have to add the purchases and the opening inventory to the direct expenses and thereafter reduce the closing inventory from there to calculate the cost of the goods sold. And then we have to reduce the cost of the goods sold from the sales. In order to determine the gross profit. So here you can see that in the previous example, how the gross profit is being calculated. The cost of the goods sold is not an item in the trading account, but it is arrived at by adding opening inventory to purchase and to direct expenses and thereby after reducing the closing inventory from there. And after that, if the credit side is more than the debit side, then it means that we have made a gross profit. If the debit side is more than the credit side, we can say that we have made a loss. Now let us understand the trading account items in detail. If the trading firm is a wholesaler, the main business would be buying and selling of the same goods. So in addition to the amount of opening inventory that debited with all the expenditures which, is, which are incurred, in bringing the goods to the go-down of the firm, and making them ready for sale. This is an important point that in terms of direct expenses, those expenses which are incurred to bring the goods to the go down of the firm, like freight, etc., or loading and loading, all the expenditures which need to be which, which have been incurred to bring the goods to the go down of the firm and to make them ready for sale. will be included in the direct expenses and apart from that the purchases will be taken also into the trading account. Now as far as direct expenses is concerned all the freight which is paid on purchase, all the cartage which is paid, all the octroi which is paid, octroi which was paid in the earlier period now it is not there need to be debited to the trading account. The basic rule is that the, the trading account should be debited with all those expenses which are incurred to bring the goods to the present location and to the present condition. Present condition means a condition which makes them ready for sale. Now let us consider these individual items in the trading account. The first item is the opening inventory. Now, since the opening inventory is the closing inventory of the last year, it must have been entered in the opening inventory account through the opening entry. That is, we have to make an entry in the beginning of the accounting period to enter the opening inventory in the opening inventory account. Therefore, this opening inventory will be there 
we'll go into the trial trial balance also this item is usually put as the first item on the debit side of the trading account and of course in the first year of the business there will be no opening inventory because that is the first year of the business so what we do is the what we do is that we debit the trading account with the opening inventory and we credit the opening stock account in the beginning of the year or beginning of the second year and the subsequent years of the business now let us look at the purchases and the purchase returns the purchase account is normally debited so it will have a debit balance it will show the gross amount of purchase of the materials the purchase return account is normally credited so it will have a credit balance and the purchase return account will show all the returns that have been received back by the supplier so on the debit side of the trading account what we do is that we reduce the purchase returns from the purchases in order to show that what are our net purchases we are doing this so therefore for this purpose we debit the purchase return account and we credit the purchase account so by doing that when we debit the purchase account purchase return account and we credit the purchase account we get a balance in the purchase account and that balance in the purchase account would go into the trading account by debiting the trading account and crediting the purchase account so one by one as we are transferring all the accounts from the ledger to the trading account we are transferring them by crediting them if they are to be debited in the trading account and if they are to be credited in the trading account then we are we are going to debit them and credit the trading account or or debit the trading account now it happens sometimes that goods are received but uh, invoice is not re yet received from the supplier so what do we do in that case so if the invoice is not received on the date of the closing of the account we must pass an entry to debit the purchase account and credit the supplier with the cost of the goods why do we do this because invoice has not been received so obviously this purchase has not been entered in our books of accounts so at the time of the closing of the accounts we realize that we have received certain goods in our inventory but uh, and they are make they are forming part of our closing inventory or they have been sold whatever it is but the relevant invoice for that is not received and therefore it is not accounted for in our purchases and therefore to account for such items in our purchases we will debit the purchase account and credit the supplier with the cost of the goods in case this is a credit sale with credit purchase and if it is cash purchase of course the cash account would be would be credited now let us look at another item called carriage of freight and words of freight now the carriage or the or the charges for the for carrying the goods to the location of the business so then freight is being paid so this freight is a direct expenditure to bring the goods to the location and of the business and they should be debited to the trading account because they are incurred to bring the materials to the firm's go down 
and also to make them available for use. But if any freight or cartage is paid on, uh, on any asset like machinery, then that will get added to the cost of that asset and that will not be debited to the trading account. And finally, we transfer the carriage or freight inwards to the trading account by debiting the trading account and by crediting the carriage or freight inwards account. What do we do with the wages? Wages which are paid to the workers are debited to the trading account. And if there is any amount which is outstanding, we must bring the, those accounts also into the books. So therefore, we must debit the wages account with those unpaid items also or outstanding items also, which are actually accrued. Because those are the wages which are incurred for the, that particular year and have accrued in that particular year, though they have not been paid. So the full wage for the accounting period, whether it is paid or not, should be accounted for. And uh, but of course we have to take into consideration that wages, if they are paid for installation of the new asset, then that would be added to the cost of the asset and that would not be debited to the trading account. And finally, whatever there is, whatever is there in the wages account, that would the wages account would be whatever balance is there with respect to that the wages account will be credited and the trading account will be debited. As far as sales and sales return is concerned, the sales account has a credit balance. It, it indicates the total sales or total net sales. The sales return account has, if the, if the sales return account has been adjusted, then it is net sales. Otherwise, the sales return account have, will have a debit balance, which will show the total amount of goods which are returned by a customer to us, to the business. And therefore, we reduce the sales return from sales and take the net of the two amounts. So, we do that by debiting the, by tra while transferring to the trading account, we debit the sales account and then we credit the sales return account by the sales return amount and then we credit the trading account by the difference between the sales account and the sales return account. Now we have to understand this thing that sometimes what we do is that we send the goods on approval basis. So they have gone out of our inventory at the end of the year when we are preparing our accounts. We find that certain goods have been sold on approval basis that is, customer has the right to return them. I mean, the sale cannot be accounted for till the time the customer has inspected the goods and found them to be appropriate. So customer has the right to return the goods within a stipulated period. And therefore, in that case, the sale entry should not be made and um, should be reversed. Even if we have taken it as a sale while sending the goods on approval basis. Therefore, those parts of the goods which have been sent to the customer for approval will not be taken as part of the sale. Because they are returnable under a, a stipulated period. Now, the next thing is the closing inventory. Normally, there is no account by which we can calculate the value of goods which are lying in our go down at the end of the year. But it is necessary to know the value of the closing inventory to ascertain the gross profit because it goes into the calculation of the cost of goods sold. Because the closing inventory is the those goods which are not sold. Therefore, the cost of sold needs to be reduced from the cost of the goods purchased and the opening inventory and the direct expenses. So therefore, we need to take the inventory physically. The closing inventory needs to be properly taken and the value of that inventory needs to be ascertained correctly. And once that is done, then we close 
when then we put it in the closing inventory account and finally we debit the closing inventory account and we credit the trading account in order to transfer this amount to the trading account sometimes we also adjust it with purchases because when we adjust with purchases we are able to easily understand the cost of the goods sold so in that case instead of uh, creating the trade the purchase account now one thing that is needs to be understood very clearly is that if we have a trial balance and if the closing stock is appearing in the trial balance the closing in inventory is then not entered in the trading account it is shown only in the balance sheet if it is appearing in the trial balance already then it, it need not be entered in the trading account it goes straight into the balance sheet because if it is appearing in the trial balance that means that the trial balance is balanced on both sides it means that it has already been adjusted to arrive at the cost of the goods sold and therefore you have to remember that if the closing stock is shown in the trial balance it should not be taken to the trading account because it is already adjusted in the with the purchases now to how to ascertain the value of the closing inventory to ascertain the value of the closing inventory we make a complete physical inventory and we make a complete list of all the items in the go down along with the quantities of course uh, damaged or obsolete items are separately listed to the list of the finished goods one should also add the goods lying with the agents which have been sent to the agents on consignment basis and we should not forget to add those which have been sent to the consignment consignee and also those goods which are sent on approval to the customer because these those goods have not been taken as part of the sales which have been sent on approval to customer and therefore we need to add them back into our inventory finally in order to value the closing inventory we need to apply the principle of cost or net realizable value whichever is lower so what happens is that while taking inventory the inventory cannot be taken sometimes on a single day and the inventory while inventory is being taken the purchases and sales are also happening so taking inventory is quite a lengthy process so immediately at the end of the year normally the taking of the inventory part should be completed but it sometimes happens that uh, either we do that a few weeks before the end of the accounting period or a few weeks after the end of the closing accounting period so inventory work is sometimes done finished before the accounting period ends and sometimes it it is completed after the accounting period ends now in that case what do we do we get we have to we have to find out the value of the inventory at the end of the year but we are having the value of the inventory on a certain date which is either before the end of the year or after the end of the year so therefore whatever inventory value we are getting we need to adjust that to relate it to the closing date of the accounting year this adjustment will be absolutely necessary because while taking inventory we have perhaps included or excluded the purchases and sales that have been made for example if we have taken the inventory after the end of the closing accounting year then those purchases and sales have been taken into account while 
uh, are already included in the closing inventory and therefore they need to be reduced. They need to be adjusted. Similarly, if it is taken before the end of the accounting year, then we need to add some purchases and sales of that accounting period which have not uh, been part of the closing inventory. The main point that has to be remembered is that in respect of whatever sales has been made, we have to establish the cost of those sales and then we have to reduce the cost of the goods sold from the sales in order to get at the gross profit. Now, we will understand this with the help of illustration. So with that, we come to the end of this webinar and we'll continue the discussion on final accounts in our next webinar.